welcome back to another edition of the Physio Tutors podcast. Today we have with us Molly Parker. Uh, Molly Parker is a, a physiotherapist and our discussion for today is going to be talking about concussions. Now, uh, having Molly with us is uh, quite beneficial as she's someone who, unfortunately, has had to deal with it uh, both professionally and personally and is still uh, dealing with that now. On top of this, uh, she's just uh, in combination uh, put out an online course for patients to be able to use as well to help them deal with their concussion symptoms as they are ongoing and give them tips and ways that they can help to deal and understand what's going on. Um, Ollie, uh, enough from me. Why don't you give us a quick one, two minute intro and then we'll dive on in. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, so my name is Molly Parker. I am from the States and I'm a physio there. Before my accident, I was working in orthopedics, and so it was a small little beach town clinic, and we ended up having kind of a reputation in town for um, kind of the difficult cases or the cases that just didn't fit in a box, and so we saw probably about 60% orthopedics, but then about 40% of my caseload was these folks with um, sensitive nervous systems, chronic pain, autoimmune, things like that. Um, so I was able to learn early on from um, my boss, who was also an amazing mentor, kind of how to start to navigate some of these injuries when we have the nervous system involved. Um, so yeah, that's my professional background. And then personally, I was um, about nine years ago now when I was 26, I was hit by a taxi cab as a pedestrian. Um, he was a driver who fell asleep ran into the crowd, hit myself and several others. And I remember at the time thinking I was so lucky that I just had a concussion and I had no idea what they could turn into. And unfortunately, what ended up happening is I got progressively worse for about two years um, until I couldn't care for myself. It took me that long to get a diagnosis because at the time, no one really knew what concussions were or that they could cause ongoing symptoms like that, myself included. And once we got the diagnosis, thus began, you know, another two years of trying to find anybody who actually knew how to treat it. So I found someone about three and a half years in who was the first person who really knew what they were doing. But at that point, I was um, almost virtually debilitated. I had severe symptoms across the board, um, including vision and vestibular um, dysautonomia, memory. Um, I had developed a severe movement disorder. And so I ended up moving home. My, my family became a caregiver. I could barely dress and feed myself. And thus the last five years has been digging out of this pile of symptoms that never really should have occurred. And I've made great progress, but I continue to be in rehab myself. Um, and so now I spend my time rather than in the clinic working with people with prolonged concussion symptoms to make sure that they're getting the care they need and that we're helping them fill in the gaps so that ultimately they don't end up like me. Wow, that's, uh, yeah, quite some, quite some story. And just listening to the way that it progressed and has progressed is, uh, can be quite scary. You've obviously got quite a handle on the things that are going on uh, due to your own personal experience and the work that you've done into looking this stuff up as well maybe you can give us a little look on to the inside of the body about what's going on patho, uh, in the pathophysiology of a concussion and as to why these things can occur. Yeah. So a concussion really occurs with a direct or indirect hit to the head or the body, realizing that this can also be a blast injury, but really it's anything that's causing that acceleration and the deacceleration of the brain within skull. And that kind of the old adage was it was, you know, brain bumps the skull and it's a bruise, but what's really happening and what causes the acute um, pathophysiology is it's when that, uh, the brain is accelerating and deaccelerating, there's stretching and shearing of the gray and white matter deep within the brain. And when that occurs, this causes ion channels, or causes ion channels along the axon to open and potassium leaves the cell membrane, causing, as we go back to our school, depolarization. And so once that happens, we have a excitatory amino acids and neurotransmitters release, and this causes um, calcium and potassium to freely flow in and out of the cell. And if there's kind of one culprit in concussion, it's calcium. 
because then this free flowing calcium is what leads to the damage of extracellular structures. And that's considered you know, phase one of an acute concussion. Now phase two comes because now we have this ion balance, uh, or imbalance, excuse me. And so to correct that, we activate the sodium potassium pump. The problem here is that burns up a tremendous amount of ATP and the calcium has also damaged the mitochondria, so we're producing significantly less. So the brain ends up in this energy crisis and this hypoxic state um, where we're not producing enough energy and we're, we're look, um, looking at some decreased blood flow. And this overall lack of oxygen leads to a disruption of the blood-brain barrier um, and followed by a local inflammatory response. So that's kind of start to finish what's happening in the acute stages. Um, and it's important to realize that about 70 to 80% of people will recover from the acute concussion stage just fine. But we do have about 20 to 30% of folks who, even though this process is finished, um, continue to have symptoms. So we look at an acute concussion and those with what you may hear as uh, post-concussion syndrome, which they're kind of changing the nomenclature of it to be called prolonged concussion symptoms. Um, whereas those folks have a different pathophysiology than the acute concussion people. And so that's important to understand when we get into treatment because we treat them a little bit different. Okay, so what's the difference uh, with those who suffer from PCS then uh, in the path of his? Yeah, so with post-concussion syndrome or prolonged concussion symptoms, now we have folks that are falling into different categories and if we can understand where their symptoms are coming from, that's how we match them into treatment. So what that looks like is just like there's not one type of knee or back injury, there's not one type of concussion. So people that have persistent symptoms may have it coming from their visual system. It may be vestibular, cardiovascular, cervical, whiplash in particular can mimic concussion symptoms. Um, this may also be cognitive. Um, so there's multiple places that this can be coming from. And what we do for those folks is identify where their lingering symptoms are, and then we match them with appropriate treatment. If we bring that back now to yourself and how things mm -hmm. went with you. So it was after a couple of years that you really started to notice the decline in what you were saying to us and how it was progressively um, yeah, slipping down the slope. Where is it in the pathophysiology that that was occurring where is it that you think that left untreated that it's gonna be getting worse yeah i think initially i was a little more susceptible um, to a more severe concussion because my injury was rotational um do you know that rotational injuries tend to be a little bit more severe than linear um and then i did have the initial you know memory loss not quite there symptoms immediately, I just got progressively worse. Um, so I really only had a one week period after, you know, I had about two weeks of symptoms. I had a week where I felt okay. And then symptoms came back and really got progressively worse for about three and a half years. Um, and I ended up following, falling into pretty much every category. Um, in particular, I had what was called dysautonomia. So my cardiovascular system and my brain basically um, uncoupled so that when I would stand up, my heart rate would get extremely high, blood volume would go down into my legs and I would start to pass out. We thought they were seizures at the time, but I now know that's what that was. Um, I had what was called exercise intolerance. So I would start to go for a run, walk, exercise of some sort and get severe pressure in my head, which I now know is from a blood flow issue, which we can treat, but I didn't know that at the time. And then I've had significant um, visual vestibular issues, um, some speech problems, difficulty finding my words, those sort of things, um, and some personality changes. Most of which has corrected at this point. Right now I'm working heavily on visual symptoms, getting that last bit of dysautonomia, um, and then working, I developed a movement disorder as well, so working on that. But it's really every category you could have, everything you could experience. I think I have had quite severely at one point or another, um, which is unfortunate, but it also makes it really 
easy for me to guide others through it now because I've developed the understanding of how all those things interconnect. Um, but yeah, it was just a big fat mess. That's a ton of stuff going on that pe- it's just not automatically associated with people that this can happen from a mm-hmm. concussion. Like there's so much that gets lost by the wayside, I think, in people's diagnosing and whatnot. But that brings us quite nicely on to one what was it that took so long do you think for it to be diagnosed as pcs and two what was it that went into the diagnosis for you to finally get that yeah i think it was initially this was back in 2011 and even though there was starting to be a shift health the healthcare system as a whole really were not aware that they were unaware um so i think most people were still under the impression much like myself that, you know, concussion symptoms aren't lasting much longer than a couple of weeks. And the fact that they had continued, I don't think anyone had, they'd attached it to the accident, but I don't think anyone attached it to the concussion. Um, The other piece is when I would say things like, you know, I don't feel right, I'm off, um, I'm extremely fatigued, people would kind of inadvertently put that into the category of what healthy people were experiencing. And what I was talking about was something completely different. So it just ended up feeling like each of those appointments, I was just talking to a wall. And usually, you know, they try a couple things that probably weren't going to help. Um, maybe medication, for example, if it didn't get better. The adage was, well, it's psychological. And so I fell through the cracks of the healthcare system with surprising ease. Um, I always thought, had that been me, I would know how to navigate it. And it's something I've worked in and I've navigated the insurance aspect. Um, But it was, I was actively trying the entire time and I fell through the cracks very, very easily. I went to see multiple different um, types of providers. So everyone from neurologist, physical therapist, chiropractic, functional med. Um, And it was really just this overall lack of awareness of what concussions were at all, um, let alone having the tools to treat it. So I think I saw 40 people before I met the first person who was actually somewhat familiar with concussions. Um, Whereas now that has shifted tremendously. We're starting to see people get to people who know what they're doing much sooner. Um, But back then it was just, people just were unaware. Wow, that's a staggeringly high number of people to yes. have to run the gauntlet through essentially to I know. finally like, how did I become one of those patients <laughs> <laughs> you know those ones that have those huge histories where you're like good lord and then all of a sudden it was me was like, oh, yeah goodness. all of a sudden yellow flag yellow flag 40 yellow flags there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, exactly <laughs> okay but what sort of signs or symptoms would you recommend uh us as clinicians to to be on the lookout for with a patient because obviously it's not that it's easy but um if someone picked up on the fact that there was an accident in this person's history it's not always necessarily Mm -hmm. from an accident it could be they were playing football not out on the field at some stage and didn't realize just how severe it was whether that's american football or english football soccer um Mm -hmm. you know what what is it that we as clinicians do you think that should be um, some of the key signs or symptoms that we look out for? If it's not in that acute phase where you look for your dizziness, you look for your sensitivity to light, where you have someone who comes into the clinic a little later on. Yeah. So if you're having someone that's coming into the clinic later on and you're going through your clinical history, the first thing you want to look for is, was there a mechanism of injury? And I think some of the things that often get missed is a concussion can occur from a blow to the head, of course, but it can also occur from an indirect hit to the head or body. So it could be, you know, they slipped on ice and they landed real hard on their sacrum um, and that that could have caused a concussion. Things like that are missed quite frequently. I think other people, I think people in general um, don't have an understanding that sometimes that's what that initial thing was. So it's going through past history. Was there a mechanism of injury? Going back, was there signs and symptoms that maybe indicated an acute concussion? And signs and symptoms tend to fall into four categories. It's sleep, cognitive, emotional, physical. And we have 22 
to symptoms that indicate a concussion. So just a brief example, sleep would be like difficulty falling asleep, difficulty staying asleep. This could also be the person that's falling asleep in a chair for no particular reason. Um, cognitive can be feeling slow, feeling foggy. They'll tell you they feel off. They're just a little bit confused and they might look and sound okay, but they're telling you they just don't feel right. Um, emotional, we'll see irritability, sadness, anger. Um, I had crying for years for no reason. <laughs> I just would cry. Um, Must be draining. And then physical, it certainly was. And then physical was like headaches, neck pain, nausea, blurred vision. So you're looking past mechanisms injury. Was there those signs and symptoms that maybe people missed because they didn't identify their dizziness as true dizziness because they just felt funky, but not necessarily, you know, spinning. And then you're looking at kind of like we talked about those different phenotypes of concussion. So is someone experiencing something that sounds like it's in the visual realm? Are they experiencing vestibular systems? Have they symptoms? Have they had this accident? and their neck is still flaring up. Or maybe they're telling you, you know, I've returned to my sport, but every time after practice, I have a massive headache. Every time I increase my heart rate, I feel nauseated. Those things are the things that should be getting your antennas up to say maybe this is a case of prolonged concussion symptoms and how has that affected this person particularly in you know, our ortho sport world, when we have someone who hasn't fully recovered or maybe the brain is compensated, you might see things like they are more prone to musculoskeletal injuries, their reaction time, their visual processing isn't quite where it should be. So they're tending to get all these extra injuries. Um, so those are kind of some of the things that you should be listening for to start to think maybe this has a concussion um, component involved. And then whether that's something you treat, um, treating from there, or something that you identify and then refer out to the appropriate person. Okay. From your experience then, is it possible for uh, us as clinicians to diagnose the severity of the concussion that we think this person may or may not be experiencing? Um, not in the acute phases. So what we used to do is we used to rate them as mild, moderate, and severe in the acute concussion. And what we know now is, and you know, it seems paradoxical, is that the severity of the initial concussion doesn't necessarily correlate with the severity of prolonged symptoms along the way. Um, so there are certain kind of risk factors, like for example, if you have a concussion, you experience dizziness that might make you more susceptible to prolonged symptoms, but the perceived severity of the quote unquote, like accident, you know, fall, sport, injury, vehicle accident, whatever, um, doesn't necessarily coordinate very well. So you can have someone who had a really severe accident um, end up better off than someone who feels like they barely bumped their head on a cupboard kind of thing. Um, so we don't grade them in that sense anymore. Further out, I don't really see people grading them. It tends to just fall under that prolonged concussion symptom umbrella. Okay. Um, and then is it possible then for people with PCS to fully recover? Because you know, yes. yourself, you've been dealing with it for a long time. So anyone listening might think this has gone on quite some time. Is it possible that mm -hmm. they could yeah, get over the hump? Yeah, so it is. Um, and what we do see is most people with prolonged concussion symptoms will recover. I'm a bit of a horror story. So I'm not like the typical case. My case is a lot more complex than normal. Um, with that said, you know, there's this old adage that if you haven't recovered fully after a year, two years, it is what it is. Um, and we just know that's not the case. So I've recovered mostly after the four year point. Um, and really what changed then is I learned how to manage my symptoms properly and I got targeted treatment. So even to this day, I'm working with a good friend in physio up here and I see changes session to session um, in my symptoms. So most people um, are going to recover kind of that three month mark, then the six month mark, then the year. But even after that, we still people still see people fully recovering from their prolonged symptoms. Um, I think the longest out I've heard of was 10 years. Jeez. Okay. You know, and it can be done, but they can be a bit of a mess. Yeah. 
what are the the sort of dangers then if someone just decides uh i'm i'm gonna push through so i uh i do mixed martial arts when i was younger um get concussions and just plow straight through and go ah it's all right i'm a little dizzy or i'll go mm-hmm. on or i'll turn up to another session what what are the dangers if if there are people that do go out and do that and do take it further and risk having another shot or whatever to the body to the brain yeah so in an acute concussion we tend to see people do better when they're removed from play immediately people do better when they're getting an evaluation within 24 to 48 hours and people do better when they're guided through the appropriate acute care or acute concussion protocols, which is a guided gradual return to physical and cognitive activity after about 24 to 48 hours of rest. So we know that stopping when a concussion or a suspected concussion has occurred is profoundly beneficial and can reduce the odds of prolonged symptoms. Now, if someone were to push through, which still happens quite commonly, um, they can be more susceptible to a second concussion. They can be more susceptible to like those musculoskeletal injuries. It can increase the amount of time that they are experiencing symptoms or um, the amount of time that they're out of their sport, if that were the case. And then if they were to get a second impact before the first has recovered, that can potentially have compounding effects and in some cases permanent effects and that goes back to our pathophysiology because remember we had you know we had those changes of ions and then we had the um, sodium potassium pump activated to um, help correct that but it burned up a lot of atp that ate the levels of atp drop we're seeing the levels of blood flow drop we're seeing and the other things involved in that are recoverable Unless you were to get a second impact before the first, before the brain has fully recovered from the first, because now you're dipping at levels that are even lower and in some cases can mimic more of what we would see in a moderate to severe TBI and may not be recoverable. Um, So long answer short, you're risking, you know, greater symptom time, greater time out of sport perhaps compounding effects if you were to receive a second concussion before the first has healed and perhaps permanent effects if you were to receive a second concussion before the first has recovered. So it's really important that we start to help people understand what can happen and that I would almost argue more importantly that the people around them are the ones that encourage them to stop and encourage them to take time off and there should be like a cultural kind of stigma shift into how we manage these injuries. Absolutely. Um, You mentioned there about uh, a gradual graded return uh, in that instance to sport, but also with those Mm -hmm. who it's not necessarily a sporting injury, if it's uh, from an accident, if it's from something else, uh, they also need a graded return. Now, way back when, when you had a concussion, it was said, right, All you need to do is rest, take a few weeks, don't do anything, no, uh, not even so much as running or cycling or whatever, just uh, off your trot, sit on the sofa and uh, take your time and come back to us later and we'll see how you're getting on. Uh, Mm -hmm. Now that's changed. What is it? What is that gradual return to, to function and not just for sport, but also for work and daily life, daily activities? How does that yeah. have a big role and impact? I am so glad you asked that because I think that's where there is still the most lack of information because we've just had, I mean, it's like concussion research these days is like drinking out of a fire hose. It's coming really quick, which is fantastic. But now we have these big shifts in recovery that I don't think we've caught everyone up on. Mm. So first thing that's important to realize is yes, like you said, it, it's not, these aren't just sports injuries. The most common cause of concussion is falls. Um, It's falls, it's motor vehicle accidents, it's assaults, um, sports as well. And these can be, you know, our service men and women. So every single person with a concussion should be going through, you know, getting in to see someone within 24 to 48 hours. That is typically the period where we have people rest 
And now what we're saying is concussion is what we consider an active recovery. So before we go into that, let's go into the out information. So like you said, the old school thought was, you know, when we get an injury, we rest it. So now that the brain has an injury, we should completely rest that too. So we had people resting in a dark room and we had them doing absolutely nothing and kind of, you know, they'd go to their doctor and their doctor would say, oh, just come back in six weeks, do nothing. So we have these people at home um, usually getting worse. And we now know that complete rest, um, putting someone in a dark room, things like that are actually detrimental to recovery. So what we recommend now is an active recovery. So that looks like, like we said, the 28 to 48 hours of rest. And then guided by a medical professional, a guided gradual return to physical and cognitive activity. And this applies to everyone. This applies whether you're getting back to sport, whether you're getting back to work, getting back to school. And typically how they have it structured is we have people, what we call return to learn or work before they return to play or physical activity. We're starting to see, and I suspect we'll see in the next consensus statement that those will be blended together a little bit. Um, but you're basically slowly increasing the amount of cognitive load. And there is a protocol. If you want to look it up, you can look up um, the Berlin consensus statement. Um, every four years, they do a consensus statement on concussion. And these are outlined in there. The most recent one was Berlin. The next one is going to be in Paris this year in October. And then they'll put out the statement in 2021. But that's a really good source. If you're someone not that familiar with concussions and you want like the most up to date, it, they do all the top names and research get together. They compile everything they've learned in the last four years and they condense it into this statement. It's a really great resource for you guys. Um, but yeah, we do, you know, we're slowly adding on cognitive ability and then slowly adding on physical activity until that person is feeling symptom free. What is really important to understand is that people's symptoms are going to resolve before the brain has fully healed. So symptoms typically we're seeing resolve within, you know, seven to 10 days. Most people in general will recover, you know, one to four weeks symptom wise, but the brain is taking three to six weeks to heal. So if you're someone who's treating someone who might be going back into a position where they could receive a second concussion, like an athlete or a police officer or a firefighter, it is critical that they understand that just because their symptoms have gone away and they're feeling better does not mean um, that the brain has fully healed. So helping your patients to understand that is important and then doing comprehensive testing to make sure that the brain has fully healed before releasing people back into whatever it is they do is huge and that will greatly decrease their risk of if they were to get a second concussion having that be compounding. Okay. I think I might have gotten a little off track there. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure we, we all knew that. Yeah, we've got to cover our bases, right? If someone does decide, actually, um, I do feel great, uh, I'm going to return and I'm going to go back to, to work. Um, yeah, let's use work as an example rather than sport. Now, what is uh, what can be detrimental to them by returning back to work too soon? Let's say... They haven't, they're not at risk of having a secondary concussion at work, but let's say they ramp up too soon. What are the side effects that we can potentially see with this person? Yeah, you would see an increase in symptoms. And that's part of what's dictating the guided gradual return because we want people to get back into school, into work, into life, into social aspects, kind of as quickly as safely possible. Um, what we'll see when it's too fast is an increase in symptoms. And so if you have them at a particular stage in their guided gradual return, they're doing well, they kick it up a bit and they start to get symptomatic, then we take them back down to the stage before, maybe for a day or two, and then increase them back up again. So that's a big part of how we determine when and how to progress people back into, you know, 100% is by those symptoms and then making sure we're adjusting and accommodating um, based on that individual symptom profile. Let's say they've gone through it. They've gone through everything. They've come out fine at the other end. Um, they're symptom free. They are returned to work back to hundred percent. 
this person who uh, has had that concussion, are they then more at risk uh, for future concussions to be more severe? So this is, isn't within that initial window where we were talking about someone getting a second mm -hmm. concussion, but later on down the line, are they more at risk of a secondary concussion, even if it's at the same impact level uh, for both brain and body? Is it more uh, potentially more dangerous for them? Do we have that sort of research? It is a not necessarily. So it can be a history of concussions may be a risk factor, but there's not necessarily a correlation. So you can have someone who's had, you know, concussion and maybe they've recovered just fine, or maybe they've been someone who's had prolonged symptoms. And a second one, concussions are really hard to compare to each other. And they're really hard to compare person to person. And they're even difficult to compare with level of impact um, because you can have someone that, you know, had a pretty, what you would consider kind of a, a looked, appeared to be a lesser injury, like, you know, not that hard of hit. And then later on, they can get a more substantial one and still not receive symptoms, even though they had it from the first one. So I guess that's to say they don't really, just because you've had one doesn't necessarily, that if you have a second, that it's going to be more severe. It doesn't necessarily dictate that you're necessarily going to have more, although it is a risk factor. Um, yeah, even we'll see folks in prolonged symptoms who still are experiencing these prolonged symptoms, right? And then they'll get a second concussion and they're outside of the window of vulnerability, but still experiencing PCS. Um, and even that concussion can heal properly um, where that person would just return down baseline after, you know, the two weeks or so of symptoms. So they are not very cut and dry, I guess I should say. And it really has to be, it really has to be individual. Okay. Um, what would you say are the main differences then if you were to pick a patient or pick up a patient who's in the acute phase and a pick up a patient who's maybe in the prolonged phase let's say they're suffering from similar symptoms but one of them's mm -hmm. you know, it's a recent concussion and the other one it's it's a concussion that was uh, let's say a year ago two years ago what have you mm -hmm. is there a difference in the way that you're going to approach the treatment uh, entirely or are there some similar aspects that you're going to look at or uh, there's a little bit of overlap with an acute concussion. I'm particularly more mindful of ruling out red flags. Kind of the initial evaluation is really to make sure, is there anything else more severe going on here? Do they have a brain bleed? Is there a skull fracture? Is there anything I need to rule out? It is heavily educational based. And then you're doing kind of the guided gradual return. Now with someone with PCS, I'm also making sure, you know, like we would with any other patient, is there something else going on here? Was there anything missed? But more than likely, you're going to be doing an evaluation to look at exactly where their symptoms are still coming from. And then that person is receiving direct treatment. Um, we'll also, you know, coach them how to return back into life and pace their days and that sort of thing. But that person's going to be receiving, for example, if they're having visual issues, they're going to go to vision therapy. If they're having vestibular issues, they're going to go to vestibular therapy. Whereas the acute person, we're just slowly guiding them back into life. They're not necessarily getting quote unquote treatment. The one, um, I don't know how to call it, delineation, I suppose, between the two is in a person with acute concussion. If after 10 days, they're still experiencing symptoms, we start to treat them as if they're going to develop prolonged symptoms. So that is we start to treat them the same way we would treat someone with prolonged symptoms. So that is the targeted treatment. So, you know, again, if they're having visual symptoms, at that point, we get them into vision therapy, um, so on and so forth. Does that make sense? Absolutely, yeah. Um, I think that brings us quite nicely into your own treatment. So let's say prior to you finally finding someone who was familiar with concussions and helped to guide you through, what was the mm -hmm. treatment that you had initially in those first couple years before things started to deteriorate? And uh, then if we can touch on sort of what it was that was done in your first 
few sessions and where you felt the biggest differences were once you finally found someone that had more of an understanding? Yeah. Um, So initially it was, you know, try this medication. Um, The one thing I did have that helped early on was someone changed my diet. So I took gluten out. I have a pretty high inflammatory component to my symptoms. Um, And so diet affects me significantly. So we did that, but then it was just a lot of, you know, they thought it was maybe suboccipital neuralgia. So I think I'd had, you know, some PT, which wasn't helpful, um, some injections and knowing what I know now, I had all these foundational things like the dysautonomia and like vision that really needed to be treated that worked. So I got progressively worse, honestly, from about three weeks on to the two year point, I was really, really bad. Um, just, I, you know, all symptoms kept getting worse symptoms that weren't there appeared. Um, I developed the movement disorder about nine months in, which got significantly worse, but most of the initial was it's fine. It'll go away. It's you. It was stuff that was never really targeting my symptoms. And if it didn't treat it, it it was my fault. Um, it was a lot of that. Wow. And then uh, pretty strong. (laughs) And yeah, I mean, honestly, the biggest difference when I started to meet people who knew what they were doing is they just stopped talking to me like I was insane. And I think that was one of the most therapeutic things. I mean, if you, if guys, if you are treating this now and you, you know, you're familiar with concussions and you can recognize that maybe you're someone who treats, you know, simpler complex cases of PCS, just you nodding your head, like you, but you've heard what that person is saying before, and this is normal for concussions in and of itself for people will be therapeutic because they've gone through this gauntlet of people of them saying something's wrong and people just not hearing it. Um, and I experienced that tremendously for the first several years. And then I started to meet people and you could tell, you could tell they knew what was up. You could tell they were familiar with it. I would say it and they would nod their head and they would tell me why. Um, and then, I mean, we could go into my treatments. I've had everything under the sun. Um, but yeah, we really started, particularly with vision therapy, um, was extremely helpful. We did some vestibular therapy. That was very helpful. It took me several years to find someone who understood exercise intolerance, um, quite frankly, which I eventually found out on my own. I eventually diagnosed my movement disorder on my own and got to the proper person. Um, I diagnosed my dysautonomia on my own and I got to the proper person. Um, it was really having to do most of the research on my own and figure it out and then get myself to the right people with a brain injury. Normally when people talk about a journey of self-discovery, it's, um, yeah, a completely different type than, uh, self-discovering all of your own issues that you're having. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah, it's quite, uh, yeah, quite some journey that you've uh, had to had to go on. Now, yes, you mentioned that you were even having trouble with uh, getting yourself dressed and whatnot. Now, that's quite some deterioration from being a healthy, fit individual. Mm-hmm. Where did that side of the therapy start? How did they, yeah, start trying to rewire and remap your body? Yeah. So I had, I think what was contributing most largely, and there was a few things, but I had what was called the dysautonomia. So when you have, I had a form called POTS. Dysautonomia is a umbrella term. There's many many different types and I had a form called POTS. So when you stand up, you virtually, some people quite literally pass out. Others feel like they're on the verge of passing out, which where I was. So But the problem with that is I didn't know what that was. So I could barely stand up to shower. It was all I could do to crawl to um, the bathroom, dressing myself. I would have to put on a pair of pants, breathe for an hour just to get enough energy and then put on my shirt. And what I know now is that was because I couldn't be upright due to the pots, but I was spending my time laying down because I felt so crappy, which makes it worse. Hmm. Um, So understanding kind of what we kind of call like this pyramid and there's different um different ones from different 
you know, groups, but understanding kind of what are these foundational symptoms that we need to address before we address some of the others. So I had had an IQ drop, I'd had memory issues, I'd had difficulty finding my speech, and that was treated, but that probably should have been one of the last things, whereas the dysautonomia, that I did not have proper blood flow to my brain, so when I was physically moving, my heart rate was up. Anytime my heart rate was up, I wasn't having blood flow to my brain, and that would cause headaches. So those were kind of the two big things that probably should have been treated first that took me... I think seven years, eight years to find somebody who knew what they were doing, which I've now um, recovered completely from POTS and I am in the middle of restoring my blood flow to my brain issues as, as we speak with the aerobic exercise program. Um, but it was just, you know, and then it was also I'm just rambling here because there's so many pieces, but it was also vision and vestibular. So I felt like I was falling all the time. I didn't know where I was in space. I would have to rub my hand along a wall. Um, my vision wasn't processing correctly. So not only were my eyes not working together, but I couldn't process what was coming in through my visual system. And then all those things were contributing to a movement disorder. So my body shook involuntarily all the time. And that was heavily fatiguing. Um, and these were all things that initially, had I gotten the treatment, would not have developed to the degree they did at all. I didn't become bed bound for several years. Um, it got progressively worse. And so, I mean, it's why I do what I do now, because these things really shouldn't have developed the way they did. Um, and so to go back to your question of what was so fatiguing, it was that so many systems of my brain weren't working. And the brain in and of itself requires you know, so much oxygen anyway, our brain takes up 20% of the you know, oxygen in our body for what it's 3% of our body weight. Um, so you're asking something that's kind of an energy suck anyways, to work hard when it's struggling to work at all. And that becomes extraordinarily fatiguing. Yeah, there's, there's so much going on there. It's kind of hard to, to dissect it. And yes. yeah, it, especially with it going on so long to yeah, hats off to you for pushing mm -hmm. through and getting to where you were getting to. I mean, seven years to get it uh, addressed is uh, that's only two years ago, and sort of you're, yeah. you're still battling with with that side of it and trying to finish it off. Um, with regards to finally being able to start the aerobic activity, how did you go about starting that? Because you know, seven years without being able to do too much of anything, and then gradually running through the rehab. How, how did they get you started with that? Was it sort of 30 seconds on an arm bike or something or? Yeah. No, it was so initially I was very active and I would try to continue to be active, but I had, you know, the movement disorder, I had the dysautonomia and I had this, what we call exercise and color. So I would try to do all this stuff and would be extraordinarily unsuccessful. So what I should have done and what we've kind of slowly undid throughout the years was first we would have needed to address my POTS, um, which I finally had addressed and treated over this last year and is now gone. And then we calmed down my movement disorder through uh, physiotherapy. There's a great group um, that pairs with UCLA called Reactive PT, and they teach a lot of this stuff and they are light years ahead of everyone else. So they do a lot of courses. So if anyone's wanting to learn more about that or having a patient with that, um, that's a great resource. So we got those two things under control. And then once we did that, um, I started kind of a modified version of what we should have done nine years ago. And so you can do a, a guided gradual return to exercise one of two ways. Um, you can use it either a treadmill or a bike is most common. On a treadmill, we use what's called the Buffalo Concussion Treadmill Test, which was created by John Levy. And it's what we use for people, you know, those 10 days plus or um, people with prolonged symptoms having exercise intolerance, and it works quite well. For somebody like me, I was so stinking deconditioned by that time, um, and I still had some VOR issues, so we started on a bike. And what that looked like was we started getting my symptomatic heart rate so that we could understand where my body needed to start. 
So we did, you know, on a bike, two minutes, easy breezy pace. Then you keep the same pace, increase the intensity by one. Um, and every two minutes you are increasing the intensity, monitoring the heart rate the whole time. Once you get to the point where your symptoms have increased by two from where you started, you stop, you record that heart rate. And in, for me being deconditioned, we started at 70% that heart rate, which for me was 105 beats per minute, <laughs> coming from being super athletic to that. Um, you could use the bike for more of an athlete or someone who's already within exercise, but as you're struggling, you would just use 80% of their heart rate. But that's what we started for me. And so then I would work at that heart rate and I would go as long as I could up to 25 minutes until I got that two point symptom increase, at which point I would stop. Um, once I got to three sessions in a row of 25 minutes at that heart rate without a two, increase, two point increase in symptoms and a decent recovery, then we kicked it up five beats per minute. So I'm at 115 now, I'm about to go up to 120. But I, you know, think about this, guys. Like, this is how cool physio is because I couldn't exercise for years. And I was told that I would be permanently disabled. And now here I am responding to treatment even this far out, which is why I'm such a huge advocate of it's never too late to make improvements. Once you start matching people with the proper treatment, I do think the body and brain will respond. Um, yeah, so that's where I'm at now. I initially could barely turn the pedals without getting my heart rate up really high. And now I have to go at a pretty good clip and try hard before I get my heart rate up to where it needs to be. It's the first time I've exercised in years. It feels fantastic. Like it feels so good to be able to move my body after all this time. Um, but yeah, there are, there are tests and treatment tools that we have in place to do this for your patients. That's awesome. I'm glad to hear that. That's uh, quite some turnaround. Um, and then what about the memory side of things? Obviously, that's also something that you suffered a little bit with. Uh, what was it that you guys did uh, with, with your physio to, to start to address that? Yeah, we have. So with like memory or cognitive stuff, so if it's like, you know, attention, difficulty, concentrating, memory, stuff like that, we tend to, you know, had I to do it all over again, leave that to a little bit later, we tend to address things in what we would consider lower down in the foundation. So addressing things in the autonomic realm first, if they're having, you know, dysautonomia, blood flow issues, then we would do more like those neural reflexes. So like you think like VOR, V1, so vision or vestibular, then we would kind of go up to neck and then we would go up to cognitive. So that's how I would have done it had I had to do it again. And I say that because cognitive, Cognitive symptoms aren't always true cognitive symptoms. Sometimes it's just the brain is putting so much extra energy into these other really base things that it's coming off like you have cognitive stuff, where we find if we treat the stuff lower down, sometimes the cognitive stuff resolves on its own. Um, and then if not, we get people into treatment. But with that said, for me, um, I worked with a speech therapist who specialized in concussion recovery. And they work with things like speech problems and finding my words. And I had a lot of working memory issues. I had a drop in my IQ, um, which is now back. But we did things like, um, uh, so it was a lot of almost like these little word games or reading these narratives and repeating it back to her, um, card and memory type games. I did a computer program called Cognit that worked on your working memory. An example might be, she would say, you know, three, six, eight, nine, twelve, and I would have to repeat that. And then as I progressed, I'd have to repeat that backwards, you know, games like that. Or she'd give me a sentence, and I would need to put the words in that sentence in alphabetical order. So I'm having to remember the sentence, I'm having to be able to hold it in my head, which is your working memory, long enough to manipulate it and put it in the correct order. So it looked kind of like that. Most of my cognitive stuff was done with a speech therapist. Um, in physio right now, we will work on things like, for example, I don't know where I am on my left side at all. So we'll work on things where all might do what that might look like is we are working on, you know, 
cervical proprioception. So I have a laser on my head, my head is turned to the left, I am looking at her on my left side while she is, you know, holding up her hands in different areas. And then she's holding up, you know, a number. So I'm having to hit her hand and say one. And I'm having to hit her hand and say five, whatever she's holding up. So that's kind of how we work in an extra cognitive demand or what we would call a dual task activity into physio. But the cognitive stuff itself was treated for me by a speech therapist. Okay. Um, what other aspects is it that you guys are addressing on the physio side then or have already addressed on the physio side? Yeah. Physio side, physio is, plays a huge role in concussion recovery, not only getting acute concussions back properly, but in prolonged symptoms, I mean, there's cervical, there's headaches, there's return to exercise, there's vestibular, there's understanding those visual components. That's all physio. One of the biggest things in these prolonged cases is getting people return to exercise. Like who has the treadmill in their clinic? You know, it's physio. So we have a huge role. Um, what she and I are personally working on right now is my vestibular system is now a rock star. So we're primarily working on vision, cervical, and then that aerobic exercise retraining program. Um, so for me, that looks like um, we might start with visual type exercises. We might do some snags on my neck, and then we're pairing that with eye tracking and with motion guidance for my cervical proprioception. And then we might end with um, what's called IM. It's that interactive metronome that helps me a little bit with my movement disorder because it helps target my basal ganglia a bit. Um, but that's kind of what a basic session for us looks like right now. And then I'm doing the bike five days a week. Okay. And you mentioned that you've been working with your speech therapist. What other um, disciplines would you recommend that if this presents to a physio, that they're just aware of that they may need to get somebody else involved because you know it's no small task and we need to make sure we don't let our egos get the best of us to say ah oh, you know i've seen some weird stuff online or x y and z try and tackle it all themselves what yeah what are the disciplines should we be aware of that we may need to uh, tug someone's shirt and get involved yeah i mean part of the so like you said like these concussions are so there's so many areas of the brain involved, which means there's going to be so many um, professions involved. So with prolonged cases, we recommend a multidisciplinary treatment team. And part of what I hope professionals are doing when they evaluate someone is they should be looking at this case and say, okay, what do I treat? Um, either what's within my profession or what's what education level do I have? Kind of what's in my wheelhouse. And then they should also be screening that individual for who else needs to be involved. So I'll give you, there can be several, but I'll give you a few common examples. So for physio, you might have someone who they have the cervical stuff, they have the headaches, they have the dizziness, but they also have blurry vision. And they also, it doesn't seem like they're catching everything in their visual field. And you check their eyes and, you know, one is a little bit higher than the other and they're not tracking together. So you might look at that and say, okay, what's my level of understanding with vision? And then you might refer out to what's called a neurooptometrist. So that's someone who's gonna specifically look at the function of the eyes and the visual system. That's a common person to be a part of the treatment team. And that's a common person to work with. Um, another might be, you know, you've done the baseline stuff, their autonomic system's working great. You've, you know, corrected some of that autonomic or the blood flow stuff, but they're still having these cognitive issues and they're still really struggling with memory and attention. You might refer them to what can be a speech therapist. This could also be a neuropsychologist to do that piece. You might have someone who you think, I really, I don't know, depending on the U in the U S we can't um, order imaging. So depending on where you are in the world, you might want to have, you know, some imaging done if you suspect maybe there's something else going on, or you might think there's a medication that might help this person while they're getting from AB. That would be, you know, their neurologist. Um, another, I'll end, end it with another common one is people will have, you know, these either gut or hormones can be affected in concussion or this fatigue that just really hasn't resolved that should have, and you might refer them to a natural path. Like, is there something metabolic? Do they need to see either an endocrinologist, naturopath, functional medicine doctor, something in that realm 
to get inflammation under control or to manage hormones or to look at is there something else contributing to this person's fatigue because it still shouldn't be as bad as it is. Um, so those are just some examples. But what you want to do, every eval, you should be asking yourself, what do I do? And then you should be screening for all of your professionals involved and making the appropriate referrals and start working um, as a team. Because I can tell you as a patient, trying to hodgepodge that together is extraordinarily difficult. So if you are doing that for your patient, I mean, you're like worth your weight in gold and you're going to get people coming out of the woodwork for you because it just makes such a difference, especially in complex cases. It has to be multidisciplinary. Yeah, no, absolutely. Especially talking to you. I, something you mentioned earlier also just about seeing a dietitian to help sort out your diet. Now that's something that I've never even considered could make an impact. As you say, you're quite sensitive to the uh, inflammatory side of things. So you've had to eliminate certain things and it, it, it just goes to show just how wide uh, the scope is uh, of potential complications within concussion, concussion treatment and why it needs to be addressed as quick as possible. Yeah. But, obviously you've been on quite a journey and that's why you've now put out the, the course online. Can you mm -hmm. talk us through that a little bit about yes. what it is and what the goal I'm is? I'm still right high on excitement because we launched last week mm -hmm. and it is a monthly membership program and it's the first of its kind exclusively meant for people with prolonged concussion symptoms. So any patient you have that's four plus weeks out is appropriate. And it basically helps them fill in all the gaps in their concussion recovery and is a great adjunct to one-on-one -on -one care. So like we talked about for patients, a lot of them are having to do their own research. They're having to put together their own teams. They're frustrated. They're getting conflicting information. So what we do is we do mentorship, education, and community. So this might look like we do research done for them. So we take them through how to plan and pace their day. We take them through headaches or sleep and give them that whole overview so that they're able to identify what they need to do in their own education. They're able to um, take some of that stuff to healthcare providers. So they're getting to the right people and managing their day properly. We do mentorship throughout the month through um, either Zoom calls or office hours. We bring on experts that they wouldn't have access to otherwise that teaches them and then asks them, their, you know, ask questions. We have tips and strategies for when they have, you know, fatigue or overwhelm. And then we also have a private community where they can share and get advice and support each other. So it is a really cool place to be. And I feel like if you have prolonged symptoms, it just saves you so much time and energy um, that it's really great. So we had a really great response. And this, in the next couple of weeks, we'll be rolling out to healthcare providers um, so if anyone is interested, just reach out to us at hello at concussioncompass.com where we can give you some codes to get discounts for your patients that might be interested in this program. And how it helps you is it lets you do what you do best and we do the rest. So you have, maybe you have someone with, you know, they need return to exercise cervical and they also have some vestibular stuff and you have so much to do in a session, but they also need planning and pacing. That's where you would send them to us so that you can focus on what you're doing and then they're getting kind of the adjunct stuff um from from us so it's kind of we hope it helps take some weight off clinician's shoulders because there's so much like you said so much to be done with these kind of things it sounds like it couples quite nicely with uh their ongoing therapy and like you say it, yes it, it gives the clinician the opportunity to say right we can focus on it and we won't have to devote so much time to those other factors such as your sleeping such as the, the uh, other aspects the ramping and stuff and managing your day I, mm -hmm. I think that's quite important it gives people yeah it gives them the opportunity to say right when I'm there I can work on that and when I'm at home I can look at the other aspects I can yeah. think of a, a patient that I had a little while back who um, I can't remember where she went she went out to the states following an accident that she'd had um, to a center, I want to say maybe around Texas or something off the top of my head, I can't remember now, mm -hmm. um, and then came back and she was very keen 
to make sure that the therapy sessions were as much therapy as she could uh, during the session and she'd focus on those other aspects uh, at a later stage on her own and mm-hmm. it, it, for her it made a massive difference so I can imagine that this is going to have a, a, a big impact for patients as they're dealing with their symptoms and just dealing with getting better and yeah moving forward yeah it takes a village absolutely yeah are there any particular learning moments that maybe either in the process of setting up the course or during your own rehab that you've experienced that you've mentioned that you've mentioned one or two actually with regards to how you would have ordered the treatment and what aspects of your treatment you would have targeted first but are there any other different learning moments that you've had over this nine year yeah. period I wish I would have known how to, what we call plan and pace, um, my day. So I initially pushed through my symptoms pretty much every day, um, which I now know is quite counterproductive. Um, but then it got to the point and I'll hear people now that they've been told to rest. So they're not pushing through at all. And it almost reminds me, almost reminds me a little bit of chronic pain where you have kind of this oversensitized system and then you have people with these lower functioning capacity levels so what we do now is we teach people and I teach myself as how to order my day so that I'm not crashing so to speak so this might look like you know I do some on you know work time and then I'm taking a little bit of a break to let my brain rest and so on and so forth and then I'm gradually building whereas before I would just plow through Um, or I would do like this boom bust cycle where I feel good, feel good for a few days and then crash. Whereas I know now if I had changed my first three days of the week to be a little more spaced out. So I had some restorative time and a little bit less then I could have gone through the whole week and actually had that be sustainable. So I think learning how to plan and pace your day is really difficult. It's something that we teach people, um, something they can find on my Instagram too. But I think particularly for therapists, you know, you only spend an hour with this person. And if what they're doing the other 99% of the time isn't conducive to um, the capacity of their brain or to improving these symptoms, then you're kind of working uphill. So having people understand how to do that um, is huge. And I wish I would have known it sooner. Nice. That's, uh, yeah, definitely something I'd say that's quite important. Um, even going back to when I was dealing with uh, my symptoms way back when, going to university and sitting in a lecture, if the lecture was two hours long, it would wipe me out. And looking back on it now, I can understand that a lot better. Whereas at the time I thought, my body's weird. I don't know, maybe it was because I trained or maybe it was because of something else. But it, yeah, if, if that's something you know, earlier on you can address it like you say and be able to push when you can push and then relax when you can and plan and literally plan and pace things better yeah nice yeah how um how can people then maybe find you on social media or get in touch with you at a later stage if they want to find out more information or a concussion compass or anything like that? Yeah. For my personal social media, it is Molly Parker PT um, on Instagram and Facebook. I'm on Instagram quite a bit more. My email is Molly at Molly Parker PT.com. And then if you are interested in concussion compass, that is our new membership program for the folks with prolonged symptoms that is at www.concussioncompass.com and you can also email us if you would like to get maybe some discounts for your patients at hello at concussioncompass.com. Grand and uh, you've already mentioned the uh, Berlin uh, consensus statement and the Buffalo uh, treadmill uh, program Mm -hmm. Are there any other resources that you can recommend uh, for our listeners? Yeah, gosh, Um, there's so many good ones. So the big one, consensus statement is great. Uh, Testing wise, I love obviously Buffalo. 
And then past that, there's some websites that have kind of more comprehensive stuff. I love UPMC's Rethink Concussion. They have a good comprehensive bit. Um, I don't have anyone that's really got all the um, research condensed for a physio perspective. We have quite a bit of it in our program for patients, but I don't know. I don't know of a really great resource otherwise. There's a few good websites. Dice. There's the Rethink Concussions. There's Concussion Legacy Foundation has some good information. Um, in Canada, there's one called Parachute. Um, yeah, I wish I had a better answer for that. No, that's that's great. That's already more than uh, yeah, more than I think people would have had at the start. Um, I really want to thank you for for your time and being able to come on and have a chat with us. And uh, yeah, no, thank you very much. It's been really insightful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for having me and thank you for everyone for learning about this stuff. It just makes such a difference for people. Well, ladies and gents, thanks again for listening in and we'll catch you next time. As always, wherever you're listening to this, we appreciate your time. And if you have any comments or suggestions, feel free to get in contact and let us know. Until next time.